Hello, IB History Year One students. Well, we've spent a few days explaining for you the rise of the nobles in the early medieval period and then the steady decline of the nobles as we enter into the modern period, as we transition into the modern period. And that's all part of periodizing history, sort of identifying characteristics that are germane to a period and recognizing when those characteristics begin to fade, because that marks the beginning of a new period. And so one of the benchmarks for the end of the medieval era and the beginning of the modern period is the decline of the, the power of the nobles and their replacement in society by the middle class and their replacement in terms of political power by absolute monarchs. The other characteristic of the medieval period was a strong, powerful church, uh, specifically the Roman Catholic Church. And, and so for the purposes of this lesson, these next few lessons, when I refer to the church, I'm speaking of the Roman Catholic Church. Now keep in mind that in the 11th century, Christianity actually split into two parts. Western Christianity, led by the Roman Catholic Church and its leader, the Pope, and then Eastern Orthodox Christianity that was really centered around um, Eastern Europe and was led by the, a, a patriarch in Constantinople. So that split had already happened er, relatively early in the medieval era. I'm really focusing on Western Europe here because I'm focusing on the events that transpired that helped transition Europe and then ultimately the world into the modern era. So we're focusing on the Roman Catholic Church when I speak of the church. And so the first thing we're gonna do today is sort of describe the nature of the church's power as it evolved during the medieval era and how it reached a high point during the lay investiture controversy of the 11th and 12th centuries. So with the collapse of Roman authority in Western Europe, uh, really the one institution that had bound the very diverse peoples of Europe together uh, disappeared. Um, the authority of the Roman government was the one thing that had held Europe together and now it was gone. In its place was the Roman Catholic Church, which at the time of the fall of Rome was still the only brand of Christianity that split with the Eastern Orthodox Christians hadn't yet happened. Um, but of course, the Roman Catholic Church had begun as an outlaw organization. The, the Christian Church had begun as an outlaw organization whose leaders were, were hunted and persecuted by the Romans. That had changed in the fourth century when the Roman Emperor Constantine himself converted to Christianity um, and, and then legalized the church. And then in the fifth century, uh, shortly before the fall of Rome, um, the Emperor Theodosius had actually made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire, displacing the old traditional Roman polytheism uh, that had prevailed as the official religion. So, so Christianity in a matter of 150 years went from being an outlaw religion to a legal religion to the official religion of the empire. And for the spread of Christianity, the circumstances really couldn't have been any better um, because the Roman empire was networked with roads that the Romans had built. Basically the entire empire could be accessed via these roads roads protected by Roman soldiers, so travelers were free to move in security all over the empire. Uh, and so Christian missionaries could travel from one empire to the other, spreading their faith. Um, and then additionally, because Rome took with it a common language, Latin, that also um, sort of assisted in the spread of Christianity, since the people of Europe had been sort of bound together by that language. At least the elites spoke Latin. And so um, the church really became the, the single force, the single institution that was able to unite all the diverse peoples of Western Europe, even after Roman authority collapsed. Um, of course, the collapse of Roman authority also led to lawlessness and chaos all across Europe. Uh, there were Viking raids. There, were, um, there was feuding between nobles and, and petty princes. Um, and of course, the hard lives of serfs and free peasants alike all contributed 
you put all that together, you have what was this very uh, short um, life expectancy for average people, uh, a life expectancy in the, the low 30s. You know, a person could expect to live 28, 30, 32 years, and that was it. And the life that you experienced was, if you were an average person, pretty miserable. Uh, a life of hard toil in the fields, sort of sun up to sundown, uh, a life of uncertainty, a life of fear because of all these other things that were going on. And so um, death was imminent. Uh, life was miserable and death was imminent. And the church offered the prospect that even if life was miserable and short, um, there was this potential for an afterlife of eternal paradise. I mean, that is essentially what the church promised. Uh, in, in the promise of salvation, uh, there was this idea that for those who practiced as Christians, um, paradise awaited, an eternity in paradise. So life might be miserable and short, but death could be a gateway to something beautiful and um, and fantastic, and um, and uh, therefore not something to be feared if you were a Christian, right? But the church also taught that this salvation required the fulfillment of what were called the sacraments. And the sacraments were rituals, there were seven rituals, and each person was expected to fulfill six of them. I say six because one of them you sort of chose from. Okay, so here we have baptism, and uh, this is the acceptance of your baptism, and then this is communion, and or confirmation, communion, uh, and then reconciliation or confession. This is matrimony, that is getting married. This is being ordained as a priest. And then finally, um, last rites, or what's sometimes called anointing of the sick, uh, in which the soul of a dying person is commended to God. Well, you only performed one of these. So either you got married or you became a priest. Remember the Roman Catholic priests still today don't get married. But the church taught that you had to fulfill these sacraments um, in order to achieve salvation. It was a requirement. Um, the Roman Catholic Church then as now holds that faith alone is not what saves a person, but that faith must be sort of confirmed or demonstrated through what the church calls good works. And the fulfillment of the sacraments are the essential good works that have to be uh, accomplished in life in order to achieve eternal life after death. Of course, all of these sacraments are administered by a priest or by the church. Um, so, you know, you, a, a priest baptizes you, a priest pre prepares you for the confirmation of your baptism, a priest serves communion, you confess your sins to a priest, a priest marriage marries you, this is becoming a priest, a priest administers last rites, just as this guy, now that's not, <laughs> that's a guy trying to do something, I don't know what, but this poor guy's dying, that's what I know. Anyway, um, so, so the church was then very influential because it controlled the gateway to salvation at a time when people were desperate to, to, to achieve salvation uh, because it was the only hope that they had in this miserable life. And so um, that was a very powerful position for the church to be in. People listened to the church. They did what the church told them to do because only the church could administer the sacraments that opened the doors to heaven. Now, of course, this also meant that the church could, could influence people's behavior through the threat of excommunication. So excommunication is being kicked out of the church. And of course, if you're kicked out of the church, then you cannot receive the sacraments. And therefore, you know, basically a, a person who was excommunicated uh, couldn't receive the sacraments, was therefore condemned to an eternity of suffering. Um, and, and, you know, that meant that if you can imagine how miserable life was, this meant that your afterlife would be even more miserable um, and that, that that would be your eternal fate. And so people feared excommunication. It was, they'd rather be, they'd rather be murdered by thieves than be excommunicated by the church. And so the church could persuade people to behave, uh, to do what the church wanted them to do. 
Um, and as you'll see, that even that even extended to powerful men like kings and emperors, um, simply through holding over their head the threat of excommunication. There was also the threat of interdict, in which the church would excommunicate an entire group of people. So um, if, a, if a, a king were misbehaving or were doing something that the church didn't want this king to do, they would threaten to place the king's entire kingdom under interdict which meant that all of the churches in the kingdom would be shut down and none of the king's subjects could receive the sacraments. And therefore all of his kings, all of the king's subjects were, um, were condemned to eternal hellfire after death. This was a way of stirring the king's subjects up against the king um, and, and putting pressure on the king to behave. So all of these were tools in the hands of the leadership of the church. Um, and by the way, excommunication not only impacted your afterlife, but your life. Because a person who was excommunicated um, was considered essentially to be non-existent to the church. This meant that um, they couldn't enter into contracts. Um, Pre-existing contracts that they had were nullified. Debts that they had, uh, had loaned to someone uh, did not have to be repaid. So it could spell financial ruin in this life as well as spiritual ruin in the next if you were excommunicated. So the church was able to wield that power to coerce people to behave the way that the church wanted them to behave. Now, at the head of the church was the Bishop of Rome. Um, and we know that person as the Pope. Uh, the Bishop, so... In the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church, priests are at the base. They are the workhorses of the church. They are the ones who have the day-to-day -day interactions with, with the faithful. They're the ones who administer baptisms, conduct marriages, bury the dead, receive confessions, serve mass. Bishops then supervise a group of priests. So they're like lead priests in a way for an area. And then of course at the top of the hierarchy is the Pope. So the Pope was the Bishop of Rome, the leader of the priests serving the churches in and around Rome. Now, how did that person come to be also the leader of the entire Catholic Church? Well, Jesus had told his apostle, Simon Peter, who you see hanging by that cross upside down there. Jesus had told him, you are the rock upon which I will build my church and I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Um, as I mentioned, he's referred to as Simon Peter. So originally his name was Simon. And one day Jesus says to him, I'm not gonna call you Simon anymore. I'm gonna call you Kephas or in Greek Petra, uh, which is Peter, which means rock. So Jesus says, you are Peter and on this rock, I will build my church and I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And early Christians, um, interpreted that, and this is the traditional interpretation um, that's held certainly by the Roman Catholic Church today, and even I think by most Protestants too, um, that, that Jesus was saying to Peter, you are the leader of the church. After I die and I'm resurrected and then ascend into heaven uh, and I leave this earth, you will be the leader of the church. And so this came to be known, this, this belief that Jesus had appointed Peter to be the head of the church is called the doctrine of Petrin supremacy. Petrin. So in other words, this is this is a the adjective that you get when you make an adjective out of the name Peter. Okay, the doctrine of Petrin supremacy that Peter was appointed by Christ by Jesus to lead the church. Well, um, Peter traveled right into the, the the belly of the beast. He traveled right into Rome itself because there was a small group of churches that were emerging in the city of Rome. Of course, at that time, Christianity was completely illegal and, and practicing Christianity in private or in public was illegal. And so in traveling to Rome to sort of serve that group of Christians who were practicing there, uh, Peter was obviously risking his life and he paid for it. I mean, he was ultimately captured by the Roman authorities and crucified. And you see him being crucified upside down here because the, the, he requested of the Romans that he not be crucified in the same manner as Jesus. He said, I'm not worthy. And so the Romans said, fine, they crucified him upside down. And he was then buried in Rome. He was buried 
in one of the cemeteries located outside the city walls. The Emperor Augustus had proclaimed that there could be no additional burials inside the city walls because the city was bursting with population. And so in a pauper's cemetery, a cemetery reserved for poor people on a hill outside the walls called the Vatican Hill, um, that's where Peter was buried. Now, um, many Christians at the time then, because Peter had been the head of the church, the rock appointed by Jesus, uh, they believed that whoever then took over as the Bishop of Rome, that is the successor of Peter, should then also be recognized as the leader of the church. And this also became part of the doctrine of Petrine supremacy. So the, the Pope actually functions in two different ways. The Pope is the Bishop of Rome, still today, is the, the leader of the priests who serve the Catholic congregations in and around um, Rome. So he remains the Bishop of Rome, but also as Pope is the leader of the entire Roman Catholic Church. And you have to remember that until the 11th century, that meant he was the head of all Christianity. And after 1100, that meant the Pope was the leader of all Christianity in Western Europe, since the Easterners had split off and formed the Orthodox Church. Um, so the Pope presided over the whole hierarchy of the church, from, from the bishops all the way down to the priests. And so the Pope, more than any other person, probably wielded real authority uh, in Europe at that time. His empire, so to speak, although it was an empire without an army, uh, his empire essentially encompassed all of Western Europe and his authority uh, prevailed in the minds of really regular Europeans, perhaps more so than that of their own kings. Sorry, there's Simon Peter. And there's the current Pope, Pope Francis. Now, um, the... Um, I mentioned that in the minds of regular people, uh, it is probable that the Pope's authority was seen as supreme to that of their own like earthly rulers. And this became a, a point of contention between popes and on the one hand, and sort of kings and princes and emperors on the other hand, whose authority was, was greater. Going all the way back to the year 494, so we're talking about, you know, less than 20 years after Rome itself was you know, overthrown by Germanic tribes. Uh, and when Rome's, the authority of the Roman government collapsed in Western Europe, just 20 years after that, Pope Gelasius I wrote a letter to the Emperor Anastasius. Now keep in mind that even though Roman authority over Western Europe had collapsed, and even though Rome itself had been overrun by what the Romans called barbarians. The authority of Rome, the authority of the Roman government continued to function farther east in really what was a continuation of the Roman Empire, but which we today call the Byzantine Empire, right, with its capital in Constantinople. So the Emperor Constantine had actually moved the capital of the empire to Constantinople. Um, and so the, the Byzantine Empire is really just a continuation of the Roman Empire. Well, by the year 494, um, the emperor of what we today call the Byzantine Empire, Anastasius, received this letter from the Pope, Pope Gelasius I. And the Pope wrote, you are also aware, dear son, that while you are permitted honorably to rule over humankind, yet in things divine, you bow your head humbly before the leaders of the clergy and await from their hands the means of your salvation. In the reception and proper disposition of the heavenly mysteries, you recognize that you should be subordinate rather than superior to the religious order, and that in these matters you depend on their judgment rather than wish to force them to follow your will. So this is the first expression that we know of where a pope is, is essentially asserting that his authority exceeds that of earthly kings and emperors. Now, he's doing so very kindly, very nicely. He's, he's sort of patting the emperor on the head and saying, hey, you do, you do a really good job of recognizing that you are subordinate to the, to the leaders of the church. Great work. Keep it up. Um, and, and largely, Gelasius here is, is commending him for recognizing that his authority does not exceed that of the, 
of the um, of the religious leaders in areas that are germane mostly to religion. Um, but over time, popes sort of increasingly asserted their authority over not just religion, but over sort of everything. Um, in a later uh, message from a pope to a emperor, uh, a pope basically says there are two types of power in the world um, represented by two swords. There is the spiritual sword, which is the power over people's spiritual lives. And there is the temporal sword, which is the power over people's earthly lives. And he says that um, th this pope wrote that the, the power over people's spiritual lives must never be grasped. That sword must never be grasped by, um, by earthly leaders like kings and princes and emperors. They have no authority whatsoever over people's spiritual lives which essentially echoes what Pope Gelasius is saying very kindly in this letter. But then this, this later Pope goes on to say, but also as for the temporal sword, the power over people's earthly lives, that is grasped, that power is grasped by kings and princes, but only in the service and only with the permission of the church. So in a sense, later popes even asserted supremacy over kings and princes in the execution or in the, in the exercise of earthly power as well. So popes were really, really sort of asserting uh, that their authority was superior. And yet uh, many kings, um, princes and emperors undertook the practice of what was called lay investiture. So, um, Lay refers to a, a non-priest, right? A person who may be a religious person, but is, is not ordained officially as a priest. Um, for example, some of you, if you attend church, uh, you may be aware that you have lay leaders in your church. Church leaders who are, are not ordained ministers, but who are nevertheless leaders in the church. Deacons, for example. Um, so lay refers to non-religious. Investiture refers to the, the um, practice of investing someone with power, giving someone power. And what lay investiture meant was that when bishops were appointed, so usually, you know, priests, as I said, were sort of the, the workhorses of the church. They did the day-to-day -day interactions with the faithful, but priests would, would usually be elevated to become bishops. Um, when if they showed themselves to be very venerable and, and prepared for the job, they'd be elevated to become bishops. Well, when you were elevated to become a bishop, you received symbols of your new additional spiritual authority. And in many kingdoms, it was the, the, the king or the prince or the emperor who undertook to present the newly appointed bishop with those symbols, like the, the, the bishop's staff, as you see this king here on the left, presenting this bishop, presenting with this staff. So um, it was and symbolically, it implied that the, the bishop was subordinate to the king or to the emperor. That since, you know, if someone can give you a symbol of power, the implication is it's theirs to give. They could, of course, arguably take it away, right? And, and so this was a symbolic subordination of church power to the power of the state. And so Pope Gregory VII, not wishing to allow that, that symbolism to continue, he abolished the practice of lay investiture. He prohibited it. Well, the Holy Roman Emperor, Henry IV, continued to practice lay investiture. So the Holy Roman Empire was what we today call Germany. Uh, Germany at that time was, was fragmented into many small states, um, largely as a result of the practice of, of German princes of dividing up their territories uh, when they died among however many sons they have. Well, you know, if you don't hand over your entire kingdom, your entire principality to your oldest son, if you divide it up, then, then as generations pass, it's going to become more and more fragmented. And that's what had happened to Germany. Um, it had become more and more fragmented over time until it, it became this sort of mosaic or patchwork of small states. They had elected an emperor to sort of, uh, the, the leaders of the biggest German states elected an emperor to kind of help keep them on the same page.
And that's who this Henry was, Henry IV, Holy Roman Emperor. The Holy Roman Emperor is what his title was. Well, he continued to practice lay investiture. And so Pope Gregory excommunicated him. That was his punishment for, for sort of defying the Pope. Well, Henry, recognizing he was in deep trouble, he's been excommunicated now. His, his subjects may choose not to follow him anymore, even because he's been excommunicated. And, and what's worse, when he dies, he's going to burn for eternity. He dressed himself up in sackcloth and he dressed up his wife and, he, and his children in, in, in essentially like, can you imagine wearing like burlap sack? And he made his way to the Pope's uh, castle at Canossa, which is in northern Italy. And he essentially begged, cowered outside the Pope's door for three days with his wife and his, her, their infant and, and their young son. They cowered outside the Pope's door for three days. Gregory, Pope Gregory himself, in his own journal recalled, he came at length of his own accord, showing nothing of hostility or boldness, and there, having laid aside all the belongings of royalty, wretchedly, with bare feet and clad in wool, he continued for three days to stand before the gate of the castle. Nor did he desist from employing with many tears until he had moved all those who were present there. So you can imagine this scene, this, this king, this emperor, dressed in sackcloth with his wife and his child, at the gates, of the, the door of the Pope's palace, crying and begging for forgiveness until Gregory finally moved by compassion, forgave him and said, OK, now don't do it again. And Henry went back, thus, uh, thus punished and, 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 you know, did, did, the, did, the, did his job the way the Pope wanted him to do. So Gregory had won this round for sure, and the papacy had won this round. Um, some secular rulers continued to practice lay investiture. And finally, um, oh, sorry, there's Gregory's uh, recollection. And so finally, in 1122, um, a deal was worked out called the Concordat of Worms. Concordat is an agreement. Worms is a town in, um, in what is today Germany. And, and basically, um, the, the, the compromise that was eventually worked out was that bishops and uh, you know, really all other um, church leaders would swear loyalty to the king and would be vassals, right? would be loyal to the king in all earthly matters. But kings would have no role in the selection or the investiture of bishops. Kings would not get to choose who was bishops. The pope chose who would be the bishop. Kings would not invest bishops with their symbols of authority. That was done by the Pope. But the bishops would swear their loyalty to the king in all earthly matters. So despite the, um, despite the, uh, the compromise that was reached here, ultimately, the incident between Gregory and Henry still nevertheless goes to show how powerful the church was and how powerful the threat of excommunication could be that it could bring even kings, princes, emperors to heal um, when, when necessary. So the question is, what happened? How did all this change as we pivot toward the modern era with the church seemingly so powerful that the leaders of the church can basically push around kings and princes and emperors? How did this change? Well, um, times changed uh, and, and one of the ways that times changed was the coming of the Renaissance and the rebirth of the Greco-Roman heritage during the Renaissance. And that certainly posed some challenges to the authority of the church. So we'll talk a little bit about that now. So uh, Renaissance originate, I mean, it's a French word meaning rebirth, but the use of the word actually originated in Italy. Um, and it means the Italian word is renatio, which again means rebirth. And, and what the Renaissance was, it was the rebirth of European civilization after the, the depths of the medieval period, which some people call the Dark Ages. But maybe more specifically, and in a way more importantly, it was the rebirth of the Greco-Roman heritage in Western Europe. You have to remember that when Western Europe was overrun by the Germanic tribes, which the Romans called barbarians, bearded ones, um, 
they, they really had little interest in preserving the heritage of the Greeks and Romans. You know, you, you think about the Greeks who had introduced philosophy and uh, mathematics and um, theater and athletics and architecture um, and sort of the Romans who had introduced new engineering techniques and new techniques for governing and things like that. All of that was of very little use to, to the Germanic tribes, uh, to the Goths, for example, or the Vandals. Um, they, they really didn't have any use for it because remember they were pre-civilized people and, you know, um, pre-civilized people don't have much use for, for philosophy or, or systems of governing. When you live tribally, the old man, the chief governs, you know, he thumps people on the head when they get out of line and that works. They don't have use for aqueducts. They don't have use for coliseums. And so they, the, the, the Germanic tribesmen who sort of took over Western Europe after they defeated Rome, they really made no effort to preserve any of that, any of what the Greeks or the Romans had accomplished, what they had created. And even if they had wanted to, they probably couldn't have done it because the preservation of a lot of those things, like the structures, like the aqueducts, they had to be preserved. They had to be maintained. And the Romans had developed an efficient system of taxation and of civil service. To do that, um, Germanic tribes, because they didn't really have a state structure, uh, because they lived and governed tribally, they didn't really have those kind of structures in place. And so what began to happen is the structures, the physical structures that the Romans had built began to fall into ruins. And of course, when you don't pass down knowledge, when you don't pass down ideas from generation to generation, that also begins to disappear. So the heritage of the ancient Greeks and Romans was sort of lost in Western Europe. It was, however, being preserved farther east. So in the Byzantine Empire, it was being preserved. And then after the 600s, where, wherever Islam went, Muslims valued knowledge, valued information. And so wherever they, they came into contact with the heritage of Greece and Rome, they translated it into Arabic for their own use. So even as Western Europe progressed generation after generation and lost any memory of what the ancient Greeks and Romans had accomplished, I mean, look, in places where there were traces of what the Romans had built, like crumbling aqueducts, literally stories circulated that these had been built by giants, a race of men who were giants and had somehow disappeared from the earth. No joke, all right? So in Western Europe, the memory of, Gre of Greece and Rome had faded completely by the end of the medieval era, pretty much. Um, but in the East, it was being preserved by Byzantines and the Muslims. The Crusades are what put Western Europeans back in touch with this ancient heritage. The Crusades and then the, the pilgrimages that followed the first crusade, which was successful, and then the trade that was introduced after that, uh, those put Western Europeans into contact with the East. And as a result of that, they, um, the preservers of the Greco-Roman heritage uh, essentially reintroduced it to Western Europe. Um, there was a great burst of enthusiasm, particularly among European scholars, as they pursued greater knowledge of this ancient heritage. Now, the first reaction of the church to this was one of concern because um, after all, the Greeks and Romans were in the eyes of the church, you know, largely they were pagans and you know, they worshiped many gods. Um, and so it could have been that the church had simply squashed this enthusiasm. All the enthusiasm for learning more about the ancient Greeks and Romans could have simply been, been done very rudely by the church, and they could have excommunicated anybody who pursued this knowledge or, or studied it or wrote about it. But here, Europe was kind of saved by a group of people called the scholastics. Scholasticism was the idea that there was no, there was no necessary incompatibility between the wisdom of the ancient Greeks and Romans and the teachings of the church. As a matter of fact, 
um, the leader of the scholastics, a guy named St. Thomas Aquinas, whom you see in the little picture here, upon uh, extensive reading of Aristotle, concluded that the, the logical processes that the ancient Greeks had pioneered could actually be used to demonstrate definitively the truth of existing church doctrines, that you could take the wisdom of people who lived before the church in terms of their processes, their logical processes, and use it to confirm the doctrines of the church. That probably saved the Renaissance um, because it was a way of, of reconciling in church leaders uh, their determination to hold on to their doctrines, their beliefs, but then on the other hand, the desire of, of intellectuals to pursue knowledge of the ancients. These became reconciled. Um, now, of course, in the eyes of the Greeks, the way that this knowledge was being used was pure, uh, that the, the, their logical process was now being used was, was a mess. For the Greeks, they invented logic as a means of inquiry, as a way of discovering new truths, not of confirming preconceived truths, right? So in a sense, the scholastics were using the tools of the Greeks to fight their way through to a truth that they had already settled themselves on, not to explore the universe in, in pursuit of, of new truths, right? So the scholastics were not using logic the way the Greeks did, um, but by now the Greeks were long dead, so who cares, right? They'll use it in support of the church. But what that did is it, it created an environment in which the church was not afraid of the knowledge of ancient Greece and Rome. It had been shown that, 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 that the ancient Greeks and Romans could be reconciled to church doctrines. And so because of that, uh, ancient Greek ideas and ancient Roman ideas were allowed to continue to be studied all across Europe, even in the universities, most of which, and really mostly in the universities, most of which were owned and operated by the church. But the fact of the matter is that the, the Greeks, the, I, one, there was an important idea of the ancient Greeks that really actually was a threat to the church in a way. Um, and it was called humanism. And it wasn't called humanism by the Greeks. It came to be called humanism. It was a new philosophy. It was, well, it was the rebirth of an old philosophy in a way with a new name. Um, but it was the philosophy of the Renaissance. Throughout the medieval period, the church had taught really that the only meaning of life was to serve God humbly and faithfully, to fulfill the sacraments, and then to await one's reward of eternal life in heaven after death. Earthly life itself and all of the things that you might accomplish in life um, really had no meaning or dignity or worth independent of the heavenly pursuit, right? So you might, you might do great things in life, you might carve great sculptures, you might paint great paintings, you might build great structures, but none of that really mattered, except in as much as if you did it to glorify God, it would help prepare you to, to go to heaven, it would set you up to go to heaven. On the other hand, you might be a ditch digger, uh, and, and if you were digging a ditch to glorify God, equally that, that had no meaning except it set you up to go to heaven. So essentially the church taught, the medieval church taught that a person lives to die. You're living to prepare yourself, to set yourself up, to earn for yourself this eternal life in heaven. Now the ancient Greeks, of course, didn't think that way at all. Um, I mean, for one thing, they didn't conceive of heaven or hell, but that's a whole other thing. Um, for the ancient Greeks, um, remember they, they certainly did things to honor their gods. So a lot of the, the great achievements of the ancient Greeks were inspired by the idea of honoring their gods, everything from the Olympic Games to, to the development of theater, to the, the magnificent structures that they built as temples. So a lot of the Greek achievements in, in, in creating this culture um, were inspired by the idea of honoring their gods. But over time, the Greeks, the Greeks had argued that, that when a person is a great athlete or a great playwright or a great poet or a great sculptor or a great architect, that's a gift that has been given to them by the gods. But the practice of that gift 
uh, taking that extraordinary gift and, and using it in an extraordinary way, yes, it's a way of honoring the gods, but it's also a way of bringing honor to oneself. You know, the Greeks, had, they referred to this as arete or excellence. And um, the pursuit of excellence, taking the gifts that the gods have given you and using them in an extraordinary way, that was something that was worthy of acclaim and, and honor in this life. So you may, you, know, you may do it to honor the gods, but in doing it, you bring honor upon yourself as well. And so, um, and so accomplishments, achievements of this life are what give life its worth and its dignity. The Greeks praised not just their gods, but the people who took the gifts their gods had given them and used them to do extraordinary things. They were heroes, right? And life, this life right here, had its own innate, in, in, within itself, worth and dignity. That, that the dignity and, and, and goodness and, and worth of life didn't have to come from preparation for death. Um, so the, the term renaissance or renatio, meaning rebirth, it refers to, yes, the rebirth of the knowledge the awareness of the Greco-Roman heritage, maybe more profoundly, it refers to the rebirth of a whole new, of a, of a, not a whole new, but of an old philosophy of life, a different approach to life, that life doesn't have to be only about preparing for eternal life after death, but that the accomplishments you achieve in this life also give this life itself its own innate worth and value and dignity. Now, oh, one more thing about this. This is not to say that humanists rejected God. They didn't. And humanists didn't reject the church either. If you think about some of the most famous humanists who were artists, for example, like Michelangelo, you know, they, they didn't reject God. They didn't reject the church. They did some of their most famous work glorifying God and the church. So they didn't reject either of those things, neither the idea nor the institution. They rejected the idea that the only dignity of life was derived from the pursuit of eternal life after death. They embraced the idea that earthly life and its accomplishments are just as worthy of praise and admiration and just as true a source of dignity as the pursuit of eternal life after death. So, and another thing that's important to remember about this is that the enthusiasm for humanism among the intellectual class, the elites, was not necessarily matched by, by sort of regular people. Right? Regular people in Europe typically came along much later. It might take a few generations for an idea that was born among the elites and, and powered forward by the elites to eventually work its way down to regular people. So that, that's important to note as well. But among the elites, this new idea was emerging, and this idea sort of was potentially alarming to the church. Not because it was really a threat to the church. Like I said, humanists you know, proclaim their loyalty to God and the church. But as long as the church continued to teach otherwise, it created a tension between what the church was teaching and what intellectuals were increasingly believing. And that could be a threat, the, the dissonance between the two. And yes, pretty soon intellectuals began to sort of say what was on their mind. So one of the most famous and most influential humanists of the Renaissance era was Niccolo Machiavelli. Um, he was an advisor to the Medici banking family who ruled Florence. So Florence is the, the epicenter of the, the Renaissance, really the Italian Renaissance, but really the whole European Renaissance. And the Medici banking family was so powerful that they had essentially taken over political control of the city. One of their, their advisors was this Machiavelli. And he wrote a handbook for leadership entitled Il Principe, The Prince. In it, he sort of outlined the, the principles that rulers should follow in order to, to preserve themselves in power and to strengthen their states. And one of the um, really difficult things that he wrote was that rulers should not necessarily follow the leadership of the church or, um, or make their decisions based on church-prescribed uh, moral codes or, or ethical principles. Uh, when they're making decisions about domestic and foreign policy, 
um, Machiavelli wrote, princes should be guided by interest, by a sort of a hard headed look at what is in the best interest of their state, what is in their personal best interest. The church, he said, essentially needs to look out for itself. The church can look out for the church, but leaders and states have to look out for themselves. And if following the leadership of the church means sacrificing the interest of the state, then it's not worth it. If the moral and ethical codes and principles proclaimed by the popes and the church prevent the state from taking measures necessary to strengthen itself, prevent the leader from taking measures necessary to strengthen themselves, then that's no good. And of course, as you can imagine, this is exactly what the church was afraid of, that if people began to focus, if leaders, for example, began to focus on achieving great things for the state in this life, rather than guiding the state in the way that the church wanted it to be guided, uh, this could lead to a decline in the church's power and influence. And so this was the, this was the worst kind of result of humanism right, in the eyes of the church, that humanism might lead people to take actions. It was one thing to, to talk about this idea, but if this idea began to inform actions, those actions might begin to undermine the church's power and influence. So of course the church banned not just the prince, but all of Machiavelli's works and, and told Christians throughout Europe, you must not read this man's works. But the reality is this, as much as the church tried to ban the writings of humanists like Machiavelli, the flourishing of humanist thought um, was, was in the long run, that wasn't the real cause of the church's downfall. Uh, not the church's downfall, but the downfall of its sort of monopoly on, on authority in Western Europe. Um, truthfully, um, the emergence of humanism, the spread of humanism, the embracing of humanism was more a symptom of the church's downfall than a cause. It was more a product of self-inflicted wounds uh, of the church. Um, so this is a, a quotation from a historian named Norman Davies, who wrote a book called Europe, A History, which is a really excellent book. Um, he wrote, the emergence of humanism is incomprehensible without reference to the depths of disrepute into which the medieval church the previous fount of all authority had fallen, setting into motion the long process of disintegration, which gradually gave birth to modern Europe. So what Davies is saying is that, that, it, that humanism didn't push the church over a cliff. The church had walked to the edge of the cliff and was, was dancing around on it through its own actions. And that the, the, embracing of humanism by so many wouldn't, wouldn't have happened had the church not already begun to undermine its own authority through its own misbehaviors. So he would argue that, that the growth of humanism, the expansion of its influence, was not a cause of the church's decline, but more a symptom of it, a result, a product of it. So in our next lesson, that's what we'll get into. What's Davies talking about? You know, in what ways had the church inflicted wounds upon itself, resulting in its descending into these depths of disrepute that would ultimately lead to the church's authority and influence declining so precipitously. All right, so that's where we'll go in our next lesson. Until then, take good care of yourselves. Be safe and healthy. I look forward to teaching you soon. Bye-bye.